Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps alert. Now, I want you to concentrate on that. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he, or they, who keep alert. Bear that in mind. Now, many years ago, just want to start off with a small story. Um, in the 80s, uh, I had to go to Italy. The company I was working for was buying a lot of uh, robots for a production line. And I had to go and learn how to program them, repair them, and fix them, and do all the other strange things that you have to do with robots. So anyway, I went to a place called Brescia in Italy, and I was there for, well, I was supposed to be there for over four and a half weeks, but I learned it pretty quick and came home a bit early. Anyway, while I was there, the one thing I wanted to see and I really, really wanted to see was the painting of The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. And this is painting. Yeah. Now, people, some people say it's the finest painting in the world. Now, I don't know much about that. I know what I like, and I know what I like when I go see these things. Now, that painting, to most people, is just a little reprint, a copy, but the actual painting itself is probably on a wall twice its size. It's huge. And during the war, when they uh, dropped bombs on the church, that wall fell, that wall fell, and the back wall fell. And the only thing left standing was the wall where he did the painting. It's slightly damaged, but not a lot. Very, very small damage in the corner. And that was what I wanted to see. I thought, I've got to go see The Last Supper. And so anyway, I went there. And while I was there, I, I learned quite a few stories. And this one is in this book, and I'll just uh, read it here. Christ Incomparable. Leonardo da Vinci was a wonderful painter, and one of his masterpieces was The Last Supper, which has a history of painting of all the ages. It was painted on a convent wall, and the artist put all his talent into it. Even the cup the Lord uses was perfect. It was an ornate golden vessel, richly set with jewels. When he completed the picture, he admitted just a few friends to see it before he released it to the public. Everyone who came in exclaimed, What a wonderful cup! How it sparkled! Wow! This is fantastic. Such a cup was never painted before. Leonardo da Vinci looked at it. Mm. He immediately went and got some dark colour, splashed it all over the glittering chalice and made it look a very ordinary cheap vessel. When they asked him why he did that, he says, nothing on my painting will outshine the glory of Christ. The cup must not be the central object in all of my work. In all things, he must be preeminent the front and he's the one who shines through. So Leonardo Vinci had a very, very good hand. Started 2022. I want to read two verses. The one is, first one is Proverbs 29 and verse 18, which says, where there is no vision, people will cast off restraint, and blessed is he who keeps the law. A literal translation of that verse says, Without a vision is a people made naked. But he that keeps the law, oh, his happy. And the second, which are two verses, come from Mark 8, 28 and 29. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. But he asked them, who do you say I am? And Peter answered him, you are the cross. Looking at Proverbs 29, there are two contrasts that I want to draw our attention to. The first one is the contrast between having a vision or not having a vision. One thing that is seen to be important today is for organisations and 
church is to have vision and mission statements. Vision, mission, and vision and mission statements are meant to convey to people what the company or church is all about, at least from a theoretical or theological perspective. When it comes to churches, written vision and mission statements have value, but they can easily convey desire as opposed to reality. For example, what do you think of this vision statement? We live to share Jesus with our community that they may see, hear and receive him. Wishful thinking? Biblical? Yeah. But what are the implications of that state? The implications are that everything that the church does and everything that individuals in the church do has something to do with sharing Jesus. Now that's very good, but as Holland said, it can very much be wishful thinking. A vision from God needs to live in our hearts so that we can live it out as opposed to being written on paper. Nothing wrong with writing it on paper, by the way. A vision is something that guides or leads or perhaps we could say even dictates our life. As such, it is something that we receive or we learn or we are given. In the context of Proverbs 29 and in the context of this being God's world, a vision is a message or instruction from God that he gives us so that we can now then live our lives for God. We can live our lives in the way that God would want us to live. Proverbs 29 puts vision in an either-or category. You either have a vision from God that God has given you, or you have no vision. Now, I think it's fair to say that putting your vision in a slightly different definition, that everyone has a vision for living. It's the reason we get out of bed in the morning. It's the reason we do what we do during the day. It dictates what we do with our money, energy and time. We have a vision for living. But if it's not from God, then it's the same as having no vision. Biblically speaking, vision is our understanding of life that is given to us by God. And it doesn't just live here in our mind. It's not just something that's nice that we would agree with in our minds. It's something that dwells in our heart so that we then live it out. The second contrast in Proverbs 29 is the outcomes of having a God-given vision and the outcomes of having no vision. In the first half of the verse, there is no vision and the result is no restraint or wild living or perishing or put it in the literal translation that I read out earlier, that you ha there is no life. There is, they are naked. So in the first half there is no vision. The contrast is seen in those who keep the law. Law keepers are blessed. What law is being kept? Whose law is being kept, should I say, is a more accurate way of asking that question. It's the law of who? Yeah, God's law. And God's law is what? Ten Commandments. What do the Ten Commandments say? Here we go. A test. Ten What's the first one? I've got them written down here, so I'm cheating. So, <laughs> First one is? No other God. Second one is no images of, of God. Second one is third one is don't misuse the name of God. Third one is keep the keep the Sabbath. Third um, fourth one is honour your father mind, which is the 
only command is a, is a prompt, that'll go, will go well with you. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, six, one. Do not. No, that's not. That's not. No, that's not the sixth one. That's what's coming. Do, do not. Do not murder. And don't commit adultery. No false witness, which is the lying bit. And the last one is, which is, well, we may be able to keep all of those up, those from a, a, a legalistic perspective. But the last one is, do not covet. Which is a lot, lot, lot harder. In Deuteronomy 5, Moses repeats the Ten Commandments, then goes on and says, in response to hearing God's voice at Mount Sinai, the people were afraid of dying, so they asked Moses to be God's spokesman to them. The Lord then said to Moses in verse 29, Oh, that they had such a heart as this always, to fear me and keep my commands that it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. God commended their heart. Their vision in the heart of God was one of an awesome, totally holy, fear-inspiring God. God approved of their heart vision, even if there's a, there's a disappointment in here because they missed the boat. Then in Deuteronomy 6, the next chapter, Moses says this. Deuteronomy 6, 4-7. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk with them when, they, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. When the law of God was on their heart, when the law of God was their vision, when the law of God was such to them that that was what they naturally, I might put it that way, did, then they flourished. Keeping the law is more than just obeying the rules. The heart is involved. Where there is no vision, when God is not in the hearts of people, when people live the way that they feel like is, is right, then there is nothing to guide people and the result is lawlessness. Romans 1 talks about what happens when the law of God is on is not when the law of God is not people's heart vision. Paul sums it up in verse 28 by saying, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind do what ought not to be done. Now that was all happening right back then in the Roman Empire. And we can see it happening today. When people's heart vision is not God, when there is no vision, then something ungodly takes its place. And if we take that to its ultimate conclusion, then it's all about We will have a completely selfish world and anarchy will, will result. Now, we haven't arrived at anarchy today. But if we logically take some of the values of today to their ultimate conclusion, then we are heading that way. When God is left out of our lives, then death is the result. Let me try and drive this home with a reference to Genesis 3. Adam and Eve had just eaten the forbidden fruit and in verse 7 they realised they were naked. Now they had always been naked. But now they realised they were naked. They felt exposed. They felt vulnerable. They felt embarrassed by their nudity. The Proverbs 29 passage doesn't use the same word for naked that is used in the Genesis 3 passage. But the result is the same. It's nakedness before God and the result is death. I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about the losing of God's life. 
that he did. When people's heart vision is not God, then aimlessness comes and death is the result. When the values of God don't fill our hearts, then something else does. We, live, we then live that out. And godlessness is off. Now let's go to the Gospel of Mark. Jesus has just done some miraculous healing. He's fed thousands. He's made a blind man see. So Jesus asks his disciples who people say that he is. And they say, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say one of the prophets. And he asks them, but who do you say I am? And Peter answers that question on behalf of all of them, or at least he opens his big mouth and steps right in. But he says a very great thing. He says, you are the Christ. But what about us? Who do we say Jesus is? Now we can go a step further than Jesus. And we ought to go a step further. We should go a step further. And we should say that Jesus is my cross. Or even better still in one sense, Jesus is our cross. What does it mean that Jesus is the Christ or is my Christ, he's our Christ? No, I don't think I can ever get to the, the bottom of, the, of that statement. But I'm going to try. Peter did not say that Jesus was a cross. He said that Jesus was the Christ. Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the one that the Jewish nation had been waiting for for thousands of years. Now we could start with Genesis 3.15 and then go to Genesis 12.1-3. We could skip through Abraham, Isaac and Joseph and go to uh, sorry, and Jacob and go to Joseph. We could rush through their escape from Egypt and go to their eventual entry into the promised land. If we skipped through the judges and arrived at King David, if we did all of that, then we would miss the story that runs through all of that. The Israelite story. The story that underpins their hopes and their dreams. The Israelite nation had an incredible resilience. They had a hope that the prophets kept alive. A hope that was integral to their worship of the one true God at their temple. Their hope was that one day someone would come. They would pay a great price in destroying the devil and making them the way back to the tree of life. That someone who would come would be an Israelite. And he would be their ultimate King David. Now, I've, in one paragraph, I've just summed up many hours and hours of teaching, Old Testament teaching. By the time Jesus was born, that hope had changed. It had moved so far from the original meaning that it no longer resembled it at all. They wanted a political saviour who would free them from their Roman oppression and then they would become the ruling nation of the world. Their prophets tried time and time again to bring them back to God's original meaning, but they chose their own version. Let me read three Old Testament passages. Um, Genesis 3.15 and 12 1 to 3 are important foundational passages. I encourage you to read them. I'm not going to read them now but I'm going to read from the prophet. Three passages. Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and deal wisely and execute justice and righteousness in the land. Now we recognize that passage, don't we? Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and by his wounds we are healed. I'm sure you recognise that passage as well. And then Micah 5 too. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, 
who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming is forth is from of old, the ancient day. Now there are many more Old Testament passages, plus there are some non-biblical Jewish writings that point to the hope of the Jewish nation and these passages filled them with hope, gave them a destiny, gave them a vision to live for living. This vision in turn shaped their life as a nation and as individuals. Although they misunderstood their, these passages and therefore their hope, Jesus came and fulfilled their hope. Jesus was their Christ their Messiah, their Saviour. Jesus is also our Christ, my Christ. And as our Christ, as he is my Christ, he becomes my, he becomes our vision. What does it mean for us to have Christ as our vision? If Jesus was truly the vision of this church and of everyone who makes up Salem Baptist Church, what would change? And what would be strengthened? If Jesus was truly our heart vision, then a background assumption is that we know Jesus and what was important to him. What was important to Jesus? In the light of what our society is like, I'd like to just mention one thing. Because there are many things that could be mentioned here. But I just want to mention one thing. Jesus said in John three and ver- sorry, John six and verse thirty eight, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will but to do the will of yep, of him who sent me, his father. Later in his ministry in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus cries out to his father in prayer and says, My father, if this is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. For Jesus, life was not about what he wanted. Although, bearing in mind the Trinity, we could in turn say what Jesus wanted was what the Father wanted, but as a man he still struggled. And we see that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, what Jesus wanted was about what his Father wanted. We live in a society where individualism is a very strong value And the pleasure of self is arguably the highest goal. Jesus wasn't like that. If there was any other way than the cross, Jesus would have taken it. But there was no other way. And even though he didn't like it, he voluntarily went to the cross because he willingly obeyed his Father. When Jesus is truly our Christ, when Jesus is our vision, we will deny ourselves and do the will of our Father. Which, if you read further in the Gospel of Mark chapter 8, you will find that's where we're heading next week. Individualism is not Jesus' way. It may be our way, but it's not Jesus' way. I want to conclude with this. In 2022, God the Father has given us more time to have Jesus as our vision. When Jesus is truly our vision, the Father is pleased with the way that we live. As fallen human beings, we make mistakes and we get things wrong. Let's not beat ourselves up with that. After all, God has forgiven us. At the same time, with the power of God that is within us, 
May Jesus be our heart vision, not just in 2022, but until we see him again.